Hey, welcome to Draft Academy. My name is Mike. This video is part of a series of videos where I'll be going over the basic syntax of different programming languages. And one of the most annoying things about picking up a new programming language is having to learn all the syntax from scratch. In my own experience, it generally manifests in a lot of Google searching and stack overflow. For an experienced developer, the problem isn't understanding the concepts of programming, it's knowing how to implement those concepts in the new language. So things like variables, data types, data structures, loops, conditionals, and object orientation. All of these things are done a little bit differently in each programming language and having to research how to do it all can be extremely annoying and tedious. In this video, I'll go through and show you the basic syntax for the most common parts of the language. I'll give you a brief history of the language and we'll touch on some of the best practices and conventions used in that language. Now this is meant to be a quick run through. I won't be showing you how to install or configure anything and we won't really have time to learn how to do everything. You see, I've distilled it down into what I consider the core concepts. So the goal for this is to be a quick video so I can't cover every aspect of the language. With that being said, this video is meant for programmers who already understand the core concepts of programming. It's not gonna teach you any programming concepts. I'll simply show you how to do all the common things in the new language. So if you are new to programming, Draft Academy has hundreds of videos where I hold your hand and I walk you through everything you need to learn uh, to program, but this is meant for developers who already understand programming. So without further ado, let's get started. Ruby is a general purpose, dynamically typed and reflective object oriented programming language that was created in the 1990s by Yukihiro Matsumoto. The original intent when creating Ruby was to create a true object oriented scripting language, which at the time in Matsumoto's opinion didn't exist. Now, Ruby was designed to be simple at its core, but with an object system that was fully integrated into the language and not tacked on as a glorified add-on. At the core of Ruby is a desire for programmer productivity and fun. Ruby's focus is on the programmer, not the machine. Therefore, Ruby attempts to remove as much confusion as possible from the programming process by utilizing a simple and readable syntax and deeply integrated object orientation. Generally, all Ruby code is run using an interpreter, although there are some implementations of Ruby where it is possible to compile the code and run it on a virtual machine. The most popular Ruby interpreter is called MRI, which stands for Matz's Ruby Interpreter. Fortunately, there is no official Ruby language reference, so generally the Matz interpreter is seen as the language standard. Ruby utilizes a garbage collector, and its syntax is very minimal and simple. One reason Ruby has become so popular is due to the Ruby on Rails web application framework. Rails is extremely easy to use, which is why it's the framework of choice for tons of large companies like GitHub, Twitch, and Hulu. Many developers choose to write Ruby using a basic text editor, but there are also more specialized integrated development environments some of the most popular include RubyMine, RadRails, and Vim. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'm gonna show you guys a lot of the you know, common programming structures and things that you're gonna be using in Ruby. And if you're coming from another language, this should kind of give you a good idea of how Ruby works and how you can do all the stuff that you did in that other language in Ruby. So over here, I have my Ruby file, and you'll notice it's just a blank file. One of the cool things about Ruby is we don't need anything uh, you know, initially here uh, for it to work. And this file is called app.ruby. So RB is that Ruby extension. That's what you're gonna wanna have on all your files. So here I have my text editor, and then over here I have a command prompt uh, or a terminal. I'm basically gonna use this to execute all of my Ruby code. So you'll be able to see the code over here and then the output of the code over here. First thing I wanna show you guys is how we can print something out to the screen in Ruby. So down here, I'm actually showing you two different ways we can do this. You can say puts. And then over here, you can just like type out a string of text or really whatever you wanna print. So here I have this string of text. It's inside of these quotation marks, I'm just printing out hello. When you type out puts, what this is gonna do is it's gonna print out whatever is over here and then it's also gonna print out a new line after it. You can also say print and print's gonna do the same thing, except print's not gonna print a new line after it. So when we print world, it won't also print a new line. And then down here I'm putting uh, exclamation points. So the result of this code is gonna be hello world with an exclamation point. Now let's talk about variables. So you can declare and you can use variables in Ruby and generally variable names are case sensitive and they can begin with letters or an underscore and after they can include numbers, letters or underscores. And the convention says to start your variable name with a lowercase word and then additional words are lowercase separated with an underscore. So if I said like my first variable, it would look like this. And this also shows you the two types of comments that we can use in Ruby. So up here we have a single line comment with this hash 
And over here we have a multi-line comment beginning with this equals begin and ending with the equals end. So down here we have a bunch of different variables and Ruby is dynamically typed. So you don't have to like rigorously specify the data type that you're trying to store. But there are different data types. So for example, I have a variable here called name and I set it equal to a string. So a string of text is gonna be anything in between these quotation marks. Then we have an integer, which is gonna be um, just a whole number. We also have a decimal or some people call this a double or a floating point number. Um, and it's just like that with a decimal. And then we have a Boolean. So a Boolean can have values true or false, just like that. If we want, we can modify these variables. So I could give name a new value. I could say like name is equal to something else. And then if we wanted to print out the variables um, onto the screen, we have a couple options. So um, one way you could do this, like print out a variable and a string together is using concatenation. So down here I have like the string and then I'm concatenating the uh, variable or you can interweave it into the actual string using this hashtag open and closed curly bracket and then the name of the variable inside. You'll see over here when I run this program, we're printing out your name is John and then your name is John. So those are two different ways you can do it and it's really just personal preference which one you wanna use. Now that we've looked at variables, why don't we take a look at casting and converting? So how can we take one uh, data type and convert it or cast it to another data type? Well, I'm gonna show you guys down here if I have like a number, for example, like 3.14, I can say 3.14 dot 2i, and this is gonna stand for two integer. So see over here when I print this out, instead of printing out 3.14, we just print out the integer value, which is just gonna be a three. I could also do the same thing to a float. So I could say like the number dot 2f, and that's gonna stand for two float. So now we're printing out 3.0, just like that. And if you wanted, you could also convert a number to a string. So actually, this is messed up. Uh, so if I had like 3.0 here, I could say dot 2s. And what this is going to do is it's going to convert that into a string. You can see it looks the same. Um, so 2i, 2f, and 2s, uh, or 2 integer, 2 float, or 2 string. And then down here, we can actually convert a string into an integer or a float. So down here, I'm putting out 100 plus, And then I have this string, which has a number 50 inside of it. And then I could say dot 2i, and that'll convert this to an integer. So you can see over here, we get 150. Same thing for a float. So I can say 50.99.2f, and then we get that. So we can actually add with these numbers, even though they're trapped in strings to begin with. Speaking of strings, let's take a look at all the different things we can do with strings. Strings are one of the most common uh, data types that we're gonna use in our programs. Here I have a string variable, um, it's just called greeting. And the first thing you'll see down here are the index positions. So when we index a string, we start at index position zero. This is pretty common across most programming languages. So I would say that this H character is at index position zero in the string. So this string has five characters, but the last character is at index position four because we start indexing at zero. Down here I can say like greeting.length and so tell me how many characters are in at five. If I wanna access a specific character in the string, I can access it uh, directly using its index. So I can say the name of the string or the string itself and then open and close square brackets and then the index of the character that I wanna access. So over here, like greeting zero is gonna give me this H back. I can also check to see if a string has a specific substring in it or a specific character. So I could say like greeting dot include question mark and then a space and then basically like whatever substring I'm looking for. And this will give me a true or a false value. So greeting dot include LLO is gonna give me true back because it's true that it's in there. If I did it for something like a Z, so I have greeting dot include Z, this is gonna give me false because Z isn't in the string. And down here you can also do like a substring. So I could grab uh, you know a specific part of the string and this is gonna take two numbers. So the first is gonna be the starting index and the second is gonna be the length. So it's gonna be however many characters I wanna grab. So we start at index, index position one with E and then we're gonna grab one, two, three characters. So we get E, L, L, just like that. So that's some basic stuff that you can do with strings in Ruby. Obviously there's more stuff you can do. Uh, if you just go online and look up like Ruby string API, you know, you'll find a whole listing of little functions that you can use. All right, now let's take a look at some numbers. So in addition to strings, a lot of times we're gonna to wanna to work with numbers and Ruby works with numbers really well. So you can just multiply numbers. Like I could put out two times three and that's gonna give me six over here. So you can add, subtract, divide and multiply numbers. You can also do this little exponent. So if I said like two asterisk asterisk three, this is gonna be two raised to the third power. So you can see over here we get eight. You'd also do the modulus operator. So modulus operator will divide two numbers and return the remainder. So if I said like 10 mod three, this would be 10 divided by three, which is three with a remainder of one. So it's gonna give us one back because that's the remainder. You can see over here we get one. And then also you can specify order of operations. So I have this little equation right here, one plus two times three. By default, Ruby's gonna do the multiplication first. So it'll do two times three, which is six plus one, and we're gonna get seven. 
But if I put a parentheses around the addition, so parentheses around one plus two, now when I run the program, it'll do that again. You see, we get nine because it's one plus two is three times three is nine. All right, and then also I wanna show you guys how integers and doubles interact. So over here I have the integer 10 divided by the uh, floating point number of the double or, or the decimal 3.0. And you'll notice that we get a decimal number back. If I was to change this to an integer and then I run the program again, you'll notice now we're just getting an integer back. So when you uh, perform math operations on two integers, you get an integer back. When you perform math operations on an integer and a decimal, you get a decimal back. And obviously two decimals will give you a decimal back as well. Down here, I have another variable. It's just called num and I set it equal to 10. What I can do is I can say num plus equals 100. And that's the same as me saying num is equal to num plus 100. So basically I'm taking num, I'm adding 100 to it and it's all getting stored back in this num variable. So then when I print out num, you'll notice that we get 110 over there. There's also some other uh, cool little functions that we can use on numbers. So I have this num, it's uh, just negative 36.8. Pretty simple. I could say like num.abs, so this is an absolute value function. And you'll see over here it returns the absolute value, so we're just getting 36.8. You could also round it, so what this is gonna do is gonna, gonna round it according to normal rounding rules, so we get negative 37. There's also a special math class in Ruby, and the math class has some really useful uh, functions or methods. So I could say like math with an uppercase m dot sqrt square root. That'll give me the square root of 144. I could also do like math dot log zero and this will give me this infinity number. So that kind of gives you an idea. And obviously the math class has a bunch of these little methods that you can use and sort of play around with. All right, now let's take a look at getting user input. So obviously in any programming language, there's tons of ways you can get input from a user but this is just gonna allow the user to enter in some information over here in the console. So the first thing we wanna do always is just prompt the user to enter some information. So I can just say like, enter your name. And then if I want, all I have to do to get information is I can just say like name is equal to gets. So I'm basically creating this variable name and inside of this name variable, I'm gonna store the result of gets. And this gets is a special keyword which is gonna pause the program, wait for the user to enter in some information. So it's kind of the opposite of puts, right? Puts will put information out into the console, gets will get information from the console. So I'm getting the information, storing inside the name variable, and then I'm just printing out like, hello, how are you? So if I typed in my name, You'll notice over here it says, hello, Mike, how are you? But you'll notice that um, it's printing this out on two separate lines. That's because when you hit that enter key, that's gonna get stored in this variable. So technically the variable is gonna have like a new line character at the end of it. If you wanna get rid of that, all you have to do is put gets dot chomp and this chomp function will basically just uh, chomp off that new line character. So now if I was to run the program again, now when I type my name in, you'll see it says, hello Mike, how are you? So obviously it's going on to the next line, but that new line character is uh, gone. So we can use gets dot chomp and generally uh, you're gonna wanna use that. So also we can get a number. So over here I have like this little calculator program. Um, basically I'm saying num1 is equal to gets.chomp, num2 is equal to gets.chomp, and then I'm just converting these both to floats and adding them so I could say like, uh, 10 and 20 and you'll see I get 30.0 right there So that's a way that you could get numbers from the user. Obviously you have to convert them, but um, it's pretty easy So that gets function is pretty useful. All right now. Let's take a look at arrays So arrays in Ruby are extremely useful. It's basically a structure where we can store multiple uh, pieces of information So I have this lucky numbers array and I just set it equal to open and close square bracket and then inside of here I have some comma separated elements so uh, one of the cool things because Ruby is dynamic, I can store multiple data types in the same array structure. So I have like a four, eight, I have a string over here and then I have a, a decimal number over here. And array indexes start at zero, just like strings. So this four element would be at index position zero. If I wanna access a specific element inside of the array, I can just refer to the array's name and then open and close square brackets and inside of here, uh, put the index of the element that I wanna access. So in this case, I'm accessing the uh, four over here and I can set this equal to 90, I can print it out, I can do whatever I want. So over here, I'm printing out lucky number zero and lucky numbers one. So we get 90 and then we get eight because eight's at index position one. And you can also put a negative value inside of here and that'll grab from the end of the array. So negative one is gonna be this 42, negative two would be 23, negative three would be 16, et cetera. So lucky numbers negative one is this 42.0. Down here, uh, we can also access like specific sections of the array. So I could say like lucky numbers two, three. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna grab the elements starting at index position two and it's gonna grab three elements. So this is the starting index and this is the length. So I grabbed 15, 16, and 23, and you can see all of those got printed out over here. 
And then what I can also do is just say like two dot dot four and that'll grab elements two through four. So now we're gonna grab two, three and four. So that's two ways of essentially doing the same thing. Finally, you can just get the length of the array by just saying the array's name dot length and you can see down here we get six because we have six elements in the array. We can also represent n-dimensional arrays. So these would be like two, three, four, or five dimensions. And um, over here, I just have a simple example of a two-dimensional array. So it's called number grid and it's just equal to this structure over here. So obviously I have my overall array and these square brackets and then each element inside is actually an array in itself. And then I can access the individual elements like this. So zero, zero would be this guy because it's at zero and then zero inside of here. And they'll see down here, I'm just printing these out. So zero, zero is gonna be 99 because we modified it. And then zero, one is gonna be two because that's what we have up here. All right, now let's take a look at some array methods that we can use or array functions, which will allow us to do different things with our array. So over here I have uh, friends and it's just equal to an empty array, just like that. And over here I can use this push method and that's gonna push elements into the array. So friends.push Oscar, Angel, and Kevin. And you'll see over here, I can just print out the contents of the array. So it's Oscar, Angela, Kevin, just like that. I could also use like friends.reverse and that'll reverse the order. So now it's Kevin, Angela, Oscar, or I could use something like friends.sort and that'll sort them alphabetically. So Angela, Kevin, Oscar. You need to be careful though, when you're using sort on arrays that have different data types inside of them, because it might not always sort the way that you expect. Obviously with strings, it's, you know, alphabetically is pretty obvious. And with numbers, you do it numerically, but if you have a mixture of, you know, Boolean strings and numbers, and it might be a little bit wonky as far as how it gets sorted. And down here, we can say like friends.includes. This is similar to what we did with the string. Basically, I'm checking to see if a specific element is inside of the array. So I can say friends.include question mark space Oscar. And this is gonna be true because Oscar's in the array. If I wanted, I could remove an element. So I could say friends.pop and that'll remove that last element from the array. So it'll pop it off. So now if I run this program again, you'll see Kevin gets removed from the array. So that's like some basic stuff that you can do. Obviously there's more of these little methods that you can use, but those are kind of like the most basic ones that you can kind of use to uh, insert and remove elements from the array. All right, now we're gonna take a look at methods. Uh, people also call these functions, uh, same thing. And so over here to create a method, I can just say def and then the name of the method and method naming rules are gonna be the same as variable naming rules. Over here, I can specify some parameters. So I can say num1, num2, these are like arguments that this uh, function is going to accept. And then I just put this end keyword here and anything that's inside of the def and the end keywords is gonna be considered inside of the function. And down here, I'm using the return keyword to return a specific value back to the caller. And this return keyword will both return a value and it'll also just break you out of the function when you're done executing. Now you'll notice over here, I'm just saying sum. So I'm creating a variable sum and I'm setting it equal to add numbers four and three. So basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna run this function and it'll store the result of adding the numbers into this sum variable and then I'm printing it out. So you see over here, we get seven. Now, one of the cool things you can do in Ruby is you can actually define default uh, parameter values. So over here I have num2 is equal to 99. So if I was to get rid of that second argument, that second parameter, now it's just gonna use the default value of 99 for that. And that's really useful. You can do that on any of the parameters that you want. All right, now let's dive into conditional. So we're talking if statements. So over here I have a couple of Boolean variables. One is student and is smart. Both of them are false. Over here, I could define an if block and if else block in order to respond to those two variables. So I could say like if is student and is smart. So I could use and and that will allow me to check two conditions or I could also use or. So it's gonna be and logic versus or logic. And then down here, uh, I can have an if and I can also have an else if. So it's just E-L-S-I-F. And again, I'm checking two conditions using this and keyword. And then I can say not. So this exclamation point right here is the negation operator. That'll negate a condition. So I have the negation operator and then obviously I have my Boolean variable over here. So this is gonna negate uh, whatever value is next to it. And then we have our else and then we have our end. So generally whenever we're defining these like blocks of code in Ruby, we always start with like the block declaration. In this case, it's an if and then we end it with this end keyword. And that's like just pretty useful. I think it's pretty readable. And so down here, um, in addition to just using and working with Boolean var variables, we can also um, obtain conditions using comparison. So I could say like if one is greater than three. So obviously this is gonna be false. I could say less than though. And now this is gonna be true. So it says number comparison was true. And you can do greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than, equal to, not equals, and double equals, which will check for equality. And then down here, I can do the same thing with strings. So if I said like A less than B, this is gonna end up being true. So you'll see string comparison was true. 
Um, that's because A is uh, before B in the alphabet. So you could check for uh, values like that, or you could also check for equality using the double equals. So that's you know basically how you can use if statements. It's pretty similar to how you do it in any other language. All right, next type of conditional that we can represent is a switch statement. Switch statement is kind of a special type of if statement where we can check one value against a bunch of other values. So over here, I have a variable my grade, and it's just equal to A. I can just say case, and then obviously end it off. And then over here, I can specify the value that I want to pass into the case statement. Um, so you can call these case statements or switch statements. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. But over here, I can just say like when. And it basically, this means when the value up here, when my grade is equal to A, then we're gonna do whatever's down here. So we'll obviously print out you pass. Uh, when it's F, we'll print out you fail. And then otherwise, we'll just print out invalid grade. So if I set this to F now, instead of saying you pass, it's gonna say you fail. If I set it to like a Z, uh, that's not covered. So it's just gonna tell us that it's an invalid grade. All right, next let's take a look at dictionaries. So dictionaries, some people also call these associative arrays. It's basically a, it's essentially an array, but instead of just storing individual elements, we can store key value pairs. So I have this like test grades uh, dictionary. Basically I have a key and then it maps to a value. So the keys all need to be unique, but the values can be repeated if you want. So for example, the key Andy and Andy got a B plus on his test. We can also represent the key like this using this colon. Um, and I can say like Stanley. So the key Stanley gets mapped to C. Stanley got a C on his test. Ryan got an A. And then in, in addition to using like strings to represent the keys, you could also use numbers. So like three gets mapped to 95.2. And then down here you'll see I'm printing out. So I could say like test grades Andy is equal to B minus. So I can modify these if I wanted. And the way that you can access an individual entry in the dictionary is just by saying like the name of the dictionary open and close square brackets, and then the key. So when I say test grades Andy, it's referring to this dictionary entry up here. And then obviously I can modify the value that gets mapped to it. So test grades Andy is gonna give us that B minus, test grades colon Stanley will give us that C, and then we could also say test grades 395.2. So it's important to notice in a dictionary, if I put a number in there, that's gonna get rendered as a key, not as an index position. So you know this entry in the dictionary, so dictionaries don't necessarily have like index positions. Um, so the key is going to be this number. So you just watch that you don't get confused with that. All right, now let's take a look at while loops. A while loop is a looping structure in Ruby, basically where we can define a condition and we'll keep executing a block of code while that condition is true. So over here I have this variable index, it's equal to one. And I say while index is less than or equal to five, puts index index plus equals one. So basically uh, every time through this loop, I'm incrementing index and I'm printing it out. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then the condition becomes false after we increment it to six. So then we break out of the while loop. Pretty simple and uh, pretty powerful. So also these while loop conditions are just like the if statement conditions. So you can use like ands, um, you can use comparisons, you can use booleans, you can do everything, you know, basically you just need a, you know, something that resolves down to a boolean value inside of here, a basic condition. All right, now let's take a look at for loops. Basically, uh, you know, a for loop is just a special type of loop that will allow us to iterate over something or iterate a specific number of times. There's a lot of, um, you know, for loop type structures in Ruby that I'm going to show you guys. All of them pretty much do the same thing. So the most basic, I could just say like for index in zero dot dot five. Basically, that means for every number in range zero to five, just print it out. So I'm printing out zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Pretty basic. Um, so that's, you know, you could do that just to loop over something a specific number of times. You could also say like five. So this is a number, an integer number, five dot times do and then inside of these uh, vertical bars you put like an iterating variable and then you could print that out so now when i run my program you'll see it five times it prints this out so it starts at zero one two three four five times it prints out uh, and that's just another way to you know do something like we did up here I could also say uh, something else like this. So for example, here I have an array. This is a lucky nums array just with a bunch of numbers in it. I could say for lucky num in lucky nums. So over here, this is the name of the structure that I want to loop through. And this is going to be a iterating variable, basically a variable that's going to represent in the element inside of this list. And I could put that out. So now when I run this, it just prints out all the elements in the array. It's pretty, pretty standard stuff. And then finally, one more thing we could do is we could say like, I could say the name of the array. So lucky nums dot each, and then I could say do, and then inside of these uh, vertical bars, pass in an iterating variable, 
and then print it out. So that's going to do exactly the same thing as we did before. So, you know, there's different ways that you can do essentially the same thing. And I kind of showed you guys that here. Uh, it's really just personal preference, what you want to use. All right. Now I want to go ahead and take a look at exception catching in Ruby. So there's going to be certain times in your Ruby programs where you're going to do certain things and they're going to break your program. So you'll throw an exception or, you know, something will happen and your program will break. So I'll show you guys how to handle that. So over here, I have a line of code that'll break my program. I'm basically creating this variable num and I'm setting it equal to 10 divided by zero. It's a big no, no, you can't divide numbers by zero. So this will go ahead and throw an error for us or an exception. So when I run this, it says, zero division error, right? I threw an error. So what we can actually do is we can surround this in begin rescue tags. So I could say begin, and then I can put any, you know, risky code. This doesn't just have to be one line. You could put a whole block of code in there. And then if this code breaks, then the code in the rescue uh, is going to get executed. So now when I run my program, instead of printing out that, uh, instead of throwing the exception and terminating the program, it's just going to print out error. So I was able to successfully catch it. And this rescue will just catch any error that gets thrown. So, uh, you know, anything that goes wrong, it'll catch it. And then down here, I'll show you guys how we can catch specific errors. So I could say begin, um, you know, num is equal to 10 divided by zero. And obviously, like if I wanted, I could say rescue. And here I can specify the actual uh, error that I'm trying to catch. So this will only catch zero division errors. So if I was to run my program now, see the same thing happens. But if I had another error, for example, like if another, you know, something else went wrong, like for example, down here, if I said puts bad variable, so bad variable, this variable hasn't been created. So Ruby is, isn't gonna know what to do with it. So now when I run my program, you'll see uh, it, gets caught by this rescue and then it just says all other errors. So generally just having a, you know, a generic rescue statement right there, maybe not the smartest thing in the world, just cause it's going to catch everything. A lot of times you don't want to catch everything. There's going to be certain exceptions that, you know, you want to break the program, but, um, if you want to catch everything, then you can just put rescue here and that'll catch it. And you can put multiple, uh, rescue tags there. Uh, like I said, so finally, let's look at raising exceptions. So down here I have the code. Like if I want to raise my own custom exception, I could say like raise made up exception. And now when I run my program, you'll see that this exception gets run and it just says made up exception. So you could do that. Uh, you know, if you have a function or something that you want to throw an exception, then you could throw your own custom exception. All right. Now we're going to take a look at object orientation in Ruby. We're going to start off with the basics classes and objects. Uh, Ruby is a, a fully integrated object oriented programming language. That's one of the things I personally love about it. Basically everything in Ruby is an object, which I, for me personally, I think is awesome. Um, so, you know, anything that we're using in Ruby for the most part is an object. There's really not any, like, you know, I guess what you call primitives, everything's just an object. So over here I have a class and this is just a class I made up the book class. And when you want to define attributes of this class, you can say, uh, a T T R underscore accessor, and then define the attributes with a colon. And then, um, just like the name of the attribute. So then we can also say colon. So I have a title and an author. And then down here, I just defined like a function, or I guess we would call this a method if it's inside of a class. So it's the read book method down here. I'm just saying puts reading uh, self dot title and self dot author. So this self keyword, is going to refer to the title or the author for the specific object that's calling this function. So whatever object calls the read book function, it'll grab that object's title and that object's author. And we can denote that using this self keyword. So then down here, I'm creating an object of the book. So I'm, this is a book one, this is a variable and I'm setting it equal to a new book object. So I can just say book dot new, and then I can give this some information. So I could say like book one dot title is Harry Potter book one dot author is JK Rowling. And then I could say book one dot read book. And that's going to call this function. And you'll see over here, it says reading Harry Potter by JK Rowling. So again, self dot title and self dot author gets the title and the author that I assigned to the object. And then I could also print out the title, which is Harry Potter. All right, now let's take a look at another object oriented programming concept, which is a constructor. A constructor is a special method, which gets called when we create an instance of a class. So whenever I create an object of a class, the constructor gets called. So over here in the class, I still have the attribute accessors, but I actually created a method over here called initialize. And this is the constructor. So this keyword initialize is very important. And then I'm passing in two arguments. So this is accepting two parameters, title and author. 
And what I can do is I can say at title is equal to title and at author is equal to author. Basically, this means that the title of the object that's getting created is, is going to be equal to the title that got passed in. And the author of the object that's getting created is going to be equal to the author that got passed in. Pretty standard constructor stuff. If you're familiar with constructors, this is pretty obvious. Um, and then down here, I can just say book one is equal to book dot new. And then inside of these uh, parentheses, I can pass in the title and the author. So when I say dot new, this is actually calling this initialize method. And you can define more than one uh, initialize method. And then down here, I'm just saying puts book one dot title, and then you can see we get Harry Potter. All right, another concept, another object oriented programming concept is getters and setters. Now, getters and setters are, it's essentially a design pattern that controls the access that outside code has to the attributes of your class or your object. So over here I have my attribute accessor and I have my constructor. Um, but then if I want to create getters and setters for these, I can just say, um, def, for example, let's say I was creating getters and setters for the title. I can just create a function uh, title and it's just title is equal to, so this is going to be the setter and it takes in a title and just says, I just said put set so we can see how it's working and then at title is equal to title. And then this is going to be the getter. So def title puts get and then return at title. So if you just define two of these, one as the getter and one as the setter, then those will act automatically as the getter and the setter. And you can see over here in the constructor, when I uh, set the title, instead of saying at author is equal to author, uh, instead of doing the same thing for the title, I'm just saying self.title is equal to title. And whenever I say self.title, that's gonna refer to uh, I, either one of those uh, methods over there, whichever one is appropriate. And then down here, I can just say, you know, book one is equal to book.new. And if I want to access the book, I can just access it the same way. So I can say book one.title. When we use getters and setters in Ruby, it doesn't change the way that we access or that we modify the actual attribute. So I'm still accessing the attribute. Uh, essentially directly like I did before, although now we're going through these different methods. So generally you're only gonna wanna implement the getters and setters when you actually need them. You're not just gonna wanna do them upfront. And usually in Ruby, you're not gonna find uh, getters and setters as much. But obviously in object-oriented programming, getters and setters are extremely valuable. So that's basically how you can implement them in Ruby. All right, now let's take a look at another concept, another core concept in object-oriented programming, which is inheritance. So inheritance is where a class can inherit all the functionality, all the attributes, everything from another class. So we would say the superclass um, and then the subclass. So the subclass inherits all the attributes from the superclass. And over here I have a class, it's called chef, and this is gonna be my superclass. And the chef just has a bunch of functions or methods, I guess. So uh, make chicken and it just prints out the chef makes chicken, make salad and then make a special dish. So this is a pretty simple class. And then down here I have another chef class. It's an Italian chef class. And you'll notice that this has a couple methods, make pasta and make special dish. And I have this less than sign and then the name of this class over here. And this means inheritance. So if I say less than and then chef, it basically means that the Italian chef class is gonna inherit uh, all the functionality from the chef class. And then I can also extend on that. So I have, you know, obviously like this other make pasta method. And then over here, I'm overriding the special dish method. So the chef class up here has a make special dish method. And then the Italian chef class overrode that with its own stuff. And that's all pretty standard uh, inheritance stuff. But down here, I have two objects. So I have a chef object called my chef and I had the chef make chicken. And then I have the Italian chef object, which is also making chicken. So even though make chicken isn't defined here in the Italian chef, it's still able to use it because it's inheriting it from the chef class. So now when I run this program, you see we get chef makes chicken and the chef makes chicken. But if I was to run the make special dish method, and I can do that on both of these, you'll see now um, the chef is making a special dish and the Italian chef is making chicken parm. That's again, cause I overrode this method here on the Italian chef. So that's basically how we can do uh, inheritance in Ruby. The next thing I wanna talk to you guys about is another thing in inheritance, which is using constructors. So what happens if we have attributes on our classes and we wanna use constructors in the superclass and subclasses. So over here, again, I have my superclass, which is just chef. And I actually added in a few attributes. So I have name and age. So the chef can have a name and an age. And then down here I have my initialize function or my constructor. And over here I'm just, you know, setting the attributes like I showed you guys before. 
But over here inside of the subclass, if I want, I can also have additional attributes. So over here I have like country of origin, for example, and the Italian chef can have a country of origin attribute. So down here, what I can do is I can override the constructor or the initialize function from the superclass. So here I'm creating the initialize function and in here I'm passing a name an age and a country of origin. So down here I can set the country of origin just right here inside of the Italian chef class. Then I can call the constructor from the super class, which takes a name and an age. So over here I can just say super name age. And what that'll do is it'll use the super classes constructor in order to set the name and the age. And that way uh, you don't have to rewrite that code down here in the subclass. So then down here, I again just created a chef object and I passed in Gordon Ramsay in 50. And then down here, I created a Italian chef object, passed in um, the name, the age, and then I also passed in country of origin, which was Italy. And then finally down here, I'm just printing out my Italian chef dot age just to show that the attribute did get set. Uh, and you'll see over here, we get 55. So that can be really useful. And really, it shows you how you can define uh, additional attributes in the subclasses and then use constructors to set them. All right, so that kind of wraps up this video. I kind of showed you guys a lot of different stuff that you can do in Ruby. Now, obviously this isn't everything. There's tons of stuff that you can do in Ruby. But hopefully this gives you an idea of how Ruby works. I covered a lot of the most common stuff that you're gonna be using when you're starting off with the language. And hopefully this kind of demystifies Ruby a little bit and shows you kind of like what it's about, how it works, and then some of the sort of best practices that we can use in the Ruby programming language. It really is a great language. And I, I honestly, just on a personal note, I think it does live up to the founder's dream. It really is a fun language to program in. And I, I personally love the fact that it's so deeply ingrained with object orientation. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to Draft Academy to be the first to know when we release new content. Also, we're always looking to improve, so if you have any constructive criticism or questions or anything, leave a comment below. Finally, if you're enjoying Draft Academy and you want to help us grow, head over to draftacademy.com forward slash contribute and invest in our future.